Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to what I believe is our fifth professional networking event for alumni, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, my name is Laurie Manders. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Relations. Um, I'm new to UCL. I'm still working my way around um, where to find buildings, but I managed to get here tonight. I joined in um, February um, from Aberdeen University. You might have guessed with the accent. Um, and um, I'm delighted to be here. And one of the things that struck me is um, how diverse the um, and successful our alumni have been. And I know that we've been trying very hard to make sure that we have an opportunity to connect with alumni at all stages of their life. I think traditional alumni relations tended to be when people were much older and um, appeared on rich lists that university maybe start getting interested in them. Um, we're interested in you from the moment that you arrive at UCL and want to keep that relationship going. But in order for, that to, for UCL to be relevant to you at different stages of your career, um, we thought we have to try and think of different ways of connecting and reconnecting and that's what the purpose of tonight is about. Um, our panel tonight is, unlike the audience, are drawn from the not-for-profit sector um, from a variety of different backgrounds and the format's going to be we're going to ask two people to speak first, tell us a bit about the highs and lows of their career um, so far and then open it up to questions and then ask the other two speakers to join in and, and follow that with questions. And then we'll have an opportunity to finish the wine that's, that's left next door. Um, I thought I might kick off by um, starting to talk about the not-for-profit sector in a kind of macro sense. Um, there are 170,000 voluntary organisations in this country and 160,000 registered charities, of which universities um, are registered charities and some people can move through a university not realising that actually universities are a charity. And since 1960 there have been very registered of charities. Every year, year on year, there's been another two and a half thousand added. And nearly 700,000 people are employed in the not-for-profit sector. And the not-for-profit sector has seen the highest increase in workforce compared to private and public sector in the last year. It employs more women and it employs more people with disabilities. So first of all, I'm going to turn to my left, to Tom. This is a very diverse panel, poor Tom on his own here. Um, but Tom Dixon graduated in 2002 and I don't know, is that my mobile maybe? Uh, yeah, we did try and turn. If we move them across to that way then. I'm pretty sure mine is off. Um, Tom graduated in uh, geology in 2002 and he's now um, working as a sports events manager at Scope. Um, he started out as an appeals assistant at the Royal National Mission to deep sea fishermen and then he worked on direct mail um, there but then his passion for fundraising and sport came together um, and he wanted to get into events fundraising and is now, as I say, at Scope. Alison Baum, who's our next speaker, is um, a graduate from Oxford and, and saw the light and came and did her, 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 her master's in neuroscience at UCL. And Alison is the chief executive officer of um, a child health charity called Best Beginnings. Um, she set this up in 2006 and it's a charity that's dedicated to reducing child health inequalities in the UK. She's received numerous awards for the work that she's done. She's worked on lobbying government, on um, how women should um, have fully informed choices about how to feed their babies. And she has a very high profile in that sector. Um, prior to setting up a social enterprise, she worked as a producer and director for the BBC. And she made science and health programmes that I'm sure you all grew up with. Um, Animal Hospital, sorry, that makes you sound really old, <laughs> Alison. Um, Tomorrow's World <laughs> and Horizons. Um, and then she moved into a slightly different role at the BBC, looking at it, um, making it happen, which was all about a big programme around BBC's, BBC's internal change programme. So I'll hand over to Tom first, um, who's just going to describe his career so far. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Yeah, um, I kind of definitely stumbled into the charity sector. Having done geology, I, my big plan was to, to do, was to go into geology as a career. And uh, I happened to be um, in the summer after I'd uh, graduated just kind of looking through for administrative posts and I happened to find one at, at a charity about fishermen. I thought, oh, you know, 
whatever, I'll, I'll have a go at that. And when I got into it, um, I absolutely loved it, tried to really r progress my role there. And um, um, I stayed there for about two years in the end, really um, learning kind of about charities, about fundraising, and um, that kind of stood me in good stead for, for later in my career. And um, it was only when a, when a job came along, it was, it was to manage the London Marathon for a charity. And I love to run, and I'd done the London Marathon myself, and um, I love sport, and that kind of to, to mesh uh, the running and the sport in, with, in with, um, with a job, I thought, great, if I can't be a professional cricketer, which um, kind of <laughs> I would have done outside of geology, I thought that was great. So, um, so I got into that at, uh, at a cancer charity called World Cancer Research Fund, and um, that, was, that was really rewarding to be able to take, uh, to meet so many passionate supporters who run the London Marathon um, for all different reasons, and, and especially a, a, at a cancer charity as well, you know, a, lo a lot of people's reasons for running are because they've been so affected by cancer, and um, for me, I really, I really got to, to meet some amazing people who ran for, for different reasons. Um, I then took a year in the uh, commercial sector, um, an opportunity came up, but we won't talk about that. So um, I then, I, I didn't enjoy it, I found, it, it was actually good for me to have, go into, um, I worked for a telecoms company, um, I didn't enjoy it and found actually charities was, was where my passion lay. And uh, so I came back again to Scope three years ago, um, got back into, into the events world and um, been lucky enough to, to do some amazing things with them. Um, one of the real highs so far of my career would be um, climbing Kilimanjaro, walking along the, uh, the rim there in the early morning sun um, with someone who's got a, a niece with cerebral palsy and that was the reason they were doing the event, you know, that really inspired them and that was so inspirational for me to see that. So that was a real, a real high point. Um, Low point, I would say, you know, we, charities are affected by the recession as well, and, and we went through redundancies and restructure at the end of 2008, early 2009, and, and that, was, that was really tough, but we've come through it much stronger. Um, I believe our, our fundraising team is, is much leaner and more effective now, and we're really making great strides, especially, especially in events that everyone still loves to run and, and people are getting out there still doing amazing things for our cause. Um, so that's kind of... That's kind of me in a bit of a nutshell. Um, I think the, the type of things that have helped me to get, to get the jobs that I have are to go kind of above and beyond the normal job role um, and to take part in other things such as I'm a member of a, a committee for a special interest group of event managers forum called the Event Managers Forum, sorry, which is a lot of charities get together and share ideas. Um, so, you know, I, I go out and I do that in my spare time. I've also done the Institute of Fundraising's um, Certificate in Fundraising Management, um, which has really helped me get a theory and a grounding in fundraising because there's not actually that many qualifications you can get in fundraising out there. So um, that's really helped me get where I am, I believe. And plus, I, I think it's, it helps you to get to know other people within the sector as well, and that always helps. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, how did I get to do what I'm doing now? Well, I similarly always thought I was going to take the academic route. So I was always going to be a biologist. Um, and after my first degree, I went off and I studied bison behaviour, as you do. In fact, bison poo. Um, therein lies another talk. But um, I enjoyed it thoroughly, but came back thinking I didn't want to focus on the what's of animal behaviour, I wanted to focus on the why, so I ended up doing my Masters in Neuroscience at UCL, which was fantastic, and then was going to go on to do a PhD. Um, but during that year, something changed, and I actually realised that my passion was more in communicating ideas and actually being the frontline bench worker. Um, and I was incredibly lucky, and I got my foot in the door at the BBC as an unpaid work experience um, working on Horizon. So I learned all, all the filmmaking skills um, on the job um, and had fabulous opportunities to meet top scientists, understand their work and communicate it. And I had 10 superb years at the BBC and I was very lucky on the journey I took. Um, I guess it was a time where there was more potential kind of for growth on the job than maybe there is now. And possibly I'd still be there today if life events hadn't occurred, which made me change direction very dramatically, I guess. Um, 
I my first son was born 10 years ago, almost to the day he's just over 10, and he was born with uh, many medical problems, uh, cleft palate and breathing and feeding problems. Um, and I couldn't breastfeed for him, which was something I'd always planned to do. So I ended up um, expressing my milk. And that got me into the heady world of long-term expressing. And I, through that, I became aware of inequalities in child health in the UK and how um, mothers from lower socioeconomic groups are significantly less likely to start or to continue to breastfeed. I became the exclusive distributor of the Easy Expression bra, um, <laughs> which is, it's, it's the bra that changed my life. Um, <laughs> I haven't said that for a while. Um, which is basically a bra with holes and you put your pump on and you can double pump hands free and easy. Um, and um, I went back to the BBC after having had David and sold these bras to parents of cleft palate babies and Down syndrome babies and made money for charity, very much as a sideline while continuing in my role at the BBC. And again, still I may have continued, but um, when my second son was born, Joshua, who's coming up to, um, well, he's nearly eight, time flies. Um, he was born again with a cleft palate and he had viral meningitis as a newborn. And so I was once again thrown into a really crazy, heady world of... Um, doctors, tubes, neonatal units, intensive care, etc. Um, and it was around, as, as he, I mean, my boys have done amazingly. They are my inspiration. Um, they um, did very well. I was then due to come back, and then there was a round of voluntary redundancies. Now, I was a institutionalised BBC staff, you know, lifer. I'd been there nearly 10 years. I knew the canteen, I had my life, I made amazing films, I travelled the world, but then all the travelling the world wasn't as, wasn't of, in, of, of interest in the way it had been, you know, going to Atlanta three times in one summer or off to Siberia. Um, anyway, I um, took the voluntary redundancy and set up um, a social enterprise called Express Yourself Mums that I thought was going to be this vehicle for change specifically around breastfeeding um, and then it became quite clear to me over the next year and a half that actually that wasn't quite the right vehicle for change and actually my interests were more broadly in inequalities in child health across the board and that's when I founded um, Best Beginnings in 2006. So it's um, a journey that's been inspired by my children, also inspired by the internal change program I worked on at the BBC, making it happen. Um, where I learned about the benefits of appreciative inquiry and stakeholder engagement. And I thought we could take a lot of that same methodology that's used within change management within organizations and use that on a national level to drive change for the, to improve chances for children. So that's what got me here. Thank you. Well, thank you both for that. And I, th I think the common thread there is that you've both combined a kind of personal interest and, and also personal circumstances with um, with your career and, and that's really interesting so um, now over to you there's some roving microphones at the back so if you stick your hand up and if it'd be helpful if you just said who you are and where you work and um, just before you you ask your questions so here we go down here Um, I'm Lucy Gould. I work for Withers. We're a law firm. We do a lot of charities and philanthropy work. Um, but actually, on the side, I'm involved with a charity called the Capital Community Foundation. Um, and I was interested in what Tom said, particularly about how one of the worst experiences was um, having to respond to, to the changing climate in recent years, but actually how you felt that it had been um, an opportunity for the charity to improve in lots of ways. And we've recently driven by those circumstances, the Capital Community Foundation has merged with a Tem the Thames Community Foundation, which was kind of doing the same thing as us, and for those reasons. And I was wondering if anybody else had experienced sort of having to go down that sort of path in recent years, sort of in response to what's going on, but actually found it quite uh, beneficial, like an opportunity in a way. I've not been involved where a charity has, has had to merge um, in that way before. Uh, I mean, we see it quite a lot. Cancer Research UK, you know, became the biggest charity in the UK because of a, because of a merger. Um, but I think what, what we went through was, was really, really tough, definitely. And, but it, but it, we definitely needed to go through it. And 
we're having to go through it away again now. Now we've kind of gone through all that upheaval and the restructure. We're now seeing that, yes, it's harder to, to fundraise from people, but um, and we're having to innovate and think of new ideas and new ways um, of getting money out of people, um, which is what we do. So that's kind of the way we're going, is to really think a, around and, and just do more, um, you, you know, especially down the online route or the social network type route, just new ways of, of um, engaging with people, definitely. Um, but yeah, like you say, it's kind of... It, you you have to evolve and you have to do it, especially when, when there's a recession. How's that affected you? Um, absolutely. Um, we're a small charity, um, which actually has meant that we can be more nimble. Um, one of our key projects is a DVD that we made, our first project, um, which is a DVD for the parents of um, all babies um, from bump to breastfeeding, and it was funded by the Four Nations, so that's central funding, and it was going out free to every pregnant woman in the UK. Um, and we independently evaluated it, because the evidence base underpins everything that we do, um, and the evaluation came back and it was effective. It got put into the care pathway um, for breastfeeding, and then the central funding stopped at the end of last year. So Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales are still giving it out for free, but in England that isn't the case anymore. And that was our flag flagship project. And you could say that that, um, well, there wasn't any loss of income because what had been happening was the Department of Health was distributing it for free, but it was a project that we were reliant on the Department of Health to, to give out for free. But actually it's that whole thing of trying constantly to turn adversity into opportunity. Um, so in that instance, we've ended up having to sell the DVD to, to hospitals for one pound a DVD. It's um, not yet every hospital's taking it. Mm. Um, and we're working terribly hard and creatively coming up with new ways to make that happen. But in the meantime, it has um, brought in unrestricted income to the charity at a time that has been beneficial. Mm. So it's not straightforward and it's been very, very challenging times. And I think the idea of merges are going to become more, I mean, there are going to be more and more merges. I think there's more and more need for collaboration. There is less money out there. So mm. within this sector, it's about being creative and working together in the most effective ways, yeah. I think even at UCL, it's similar, looking at our partners, who in our case are the sort of hospitals around us, and you know, we're talking to them at the moment about how we could collaborate more effectively um, for fundraising. There was another question just here. Hello, uh, question for Alison. Oh, I'm Polly Corrigan. I'm a, I'm a full-time mum at the moment, but I was a journalist before. Um, I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more about how you start a small charity, you know, just coming from a, from a, from back, your, the background that you did, um, you know, how on earth you just go about that process. I think there needs to be a huge amount of passion, but that sounds hard, but the head needs to be in it too. One needs to have an incredibly clear idea of a problem that needs solving, um, and that sense that you happen to be in a position to be able to help. Um, an awful lot of tenacity. Um, I have to say, the transferable skills from being a filmmaker were fabulous, um, because it's about not being afraid to pick up the phone, speak to anyone. Um, it just being tenacious. Um, at the BBC, I don't like saying it, it sounds terribly kind of pompous, but we got, without thinking about it, you got into the habit of turning no's into yeses. So, you know, in terms of access to filming, um, I know there was once I was um, trying to film in a biological warfare, ex-biological warfare pl place in Novosibirsk in Russia, and it was a no, and, you know, working around it and finding ways. Um, and it's those same kind of skills in terms of um, engaging people um, early, because, of course, it's about having a, a core group of people who are supporting you um, and then taking things forward from there. So if you will it and if you think and if there's a rationale, then it can happen. But it's not for the faint hearted. Is there a question just at the back there? It's a question sort of along similar lines, I suppose, to the last couple. But um, in terms of uh, your setting up your business, um, did you ever think about approaching a charity that does something similar? Um, and um, sort of working with them, and then you would have had sort of backing, and and things might have been a bit easier. 
and yeah, in terms of um, <laughs> setting up your own business versus maybe going into another, do you think your things might have been easier, or um, had um, you had sort of the backing of another of a, uh, an organisation that was already there? Very long and hard. Um, no one was doing what we are doing. Best Beginnings does something very particular in terms of focusing on this window of opportunity, preconception to a child's second birthday, and working in a very particular way with stakeholder engagement to create resources that would drive change. So if we were just doing breastfeeding, then yes, I could have done something with a breastfeeding charity. Or if we were just doing something around premature and sick babies, which is our next big project, then I could have potentially gone and worked for a charity in that area. But because I had a very clear idea of the need for early intervention and using a collaborative approach to drive change, the only real solution was to do it myself. Um, it, I look back and I, it's funny because I don't often get time to reflect, I'm too busy doing the doing, so it's quite a, you know, I'm actually having to think really on the feet about how and why and, and when. But um, if larger organisations aren't always as able to innovate, um, if there's a way that a larger organisation has always done things and you're coming in as a newbie with a big idea, you're unlikely to get the freedom to make that happen. What I was able to do is come up with an idea and then engage all the relevant rural colleges, all the relevant charities and work with them to create something to drive change. So I, I think that you're absolutely right. If you have an idea, heck, two and a half thousand new charities a year, is that really needed? I think we should all look and think very carefully before setting up a charity, whether there isn't another way of making what one needs to make happen, happen. But sometimes I think it's necessary. I mean, uh, Scope's a £100 million a year charity, you know, we're, we're pretty big and um, it's, it's really hard to get to, to change in the organisation and part of the restructures we went through helped to change the organisation okay. um, and we had to close services that weren't making money or schools that, you know, that, that weren't um, doing the right thing by disabled people. So, um, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's so hard in a bigger organisation to, to make those changes happen. Any other questions? Just down here. Where would each of you suggest looking for opportunities in the broad, non-for-profit uh, public sector? In terms of if you were looking for a job, yeah, if you wanted to move into... <coughs> I imagine a lot of us sitting here doing what we're doing, but we have an idea of so maybe that... The sort of thing I might... I think is it needed? That was just um, a question I didn't hear. Just where are the new opportunities? You can see it again. I think it's about what makes... Oh, sorry, did no, people okay, hear? No, just in case people at the back can't hear. No, I just... Okay. Sorry. <laughs> now you can hear as well. You can definitely hear me now. Yeah. If any of you... Um, where would you suggest looking for opportunities for those people who are at the beginning or whatever stage of their career, but are just thinking in the back of their mind mm. of a career change? And rather than just stumbling across something haphazardly, where would you suggest we look to find those opportunities, rather than not looking at the scope charity and finding their recruitment, but just a general broad spectrum of not-for-profit sector work? Can I jump in on this? Because I feel like I'm doing a lot of recruitment at the moment. <laughs> um, I think you need to look at your skills. and what you Because basically what you're looking for at the end of this is a job. And... Um, uh, uh, paid jobs and NGOs, it's intensely competitive. Um, and what you will be, so, so what you need to do is look at your CV, look at your skills, the things you've been doing, not just in, in your academic career, but in the work experience that you have to date. Work out what you want to do and try and find a way to marry the two. So, for example, if you've been working in publishing, or I, mean, I don't know what your background is, or law, or something like that. You look at this, the skills that you have, and you try and find a way to make them transferable. What's very difficult is um, for people to come to me and say, oh, you know, I really want to work for myself. I really want to work for an NGO. Up until now, I've been a, I, I don't know, 
Um, I've been uh, a, 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 a delivery manager at a you know, major shopping, and, and, but now I want to work in communications. Now, I would say to them, well, listen, if you've been a logistics manager at a major supermarket, you don't think about making a shift into communications. Let's look at the skills you've got in logistics and see, okay, there are logistics positions in NGOs. Uh, what you need to take, take a look at your skills and try and find a way to make them transferable and useful um, in an NGO context, and then you have to find an NGO that fits, fits with your, fits with your motivations, fits with this, you know, the things that make you passionate, because you'll be taking salary cuts, most mm. likely, and, and what will make up for that salary cut is a, is a feeling of, of enjoying your job and doing something worthwhile. But, I mean, it's, t it's tough, and I get really good CVs from people all the time. Um, and, I, I, you know, you, you really want to say to them, please don't do a degree in development studies. <laughs> please go out and do a real job. And then find those skills that you have in, in your real job and find a way to make them applicable to what I'm looking for. And that's absolutely it. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add? <coughs> I think actually that was beautifully, beautifully <laughs> answered. It is. It's about finding that. It's. It's. You need the passion. So there's no point. It's not about what's available. It's what makes you tick. But also, it is about transferable skills. And the skills in the charitable sector. You know, we need marketeers. We need fundraisers. And and if you've got a sales background, then maybe more on event side. If if you've got a more academic background. If you've got if you've got a passion for the written word, then trust found, tr trust fundraising might be your thing. It, it's if you love organising and project management, but it is it's about playing to your strengths and your experience, but really thinking creatively because there's so much transferable. But short of looking yes. at the individual charities or not-for-profit organisations and looking at what vacancies they have available. Is there anywhere, I'm speaking from complete ignorance, mm. where you can look across the board, you, you identify your own skills, and you say, well, maybe there's a publication or a particular website that identifies. Do you want to? Maybe there's a need for. Maybe you want to say there's, <laughs> there's a lot, there's, there are, and I, I can't remember the URL, and maybe the lady at the front does, but there, there are certainly websites where you can go to look for internship opportunities and volunteering opportunities. Because I think if you're completely fresh to the sector and don't have a sense of kind of a passion or a drive in terms of what you might like to do, then that's when the opportunity of volunteering or interning can be very effective because it gives you a taste. Mm -hmm. And actually I would recommend then if you really don't have a sense of, if you have a sense that you want to work within the third sector, but don't have a sense of in what way, then I would recommend you work for a volunteer or intern at a much smaller charity because then you get a sense of the whole workings of an organization. If you go initially and work in a very large organization, you will be in a department, for example, just on the operation side or just on not just fundraising, but maybe just events fundraising. Whereas if, if you're not quite sure what fits for you, then I would explore uh, opportunities to dip your toe in the water and, and see whether it appeals <coughs> and whether it's something that you want to do. If I can just give a plug for, for universities, because I did see that universities are charities and not everybody, is, as I said, um, thinks of a university as a charity. But in terms of um, jobs and in, in development and alumni relations, um, there's a real shortage of people with skills in that, in that area, having just spent yesterday trying to recruit um, um, a deputy, um, we did, which we did. But you would be surprised at how, how small that pool was of, of people, and that was with a headhunter and a very large search. And, and again, in, in universities and development and alumni relations, there's a whole range of jobs. We have people working in database, we have people working... Um, on researching um, potential um, sources of income, with people writing proposals, with people helping with events like tonight, with people out there face-to-face -face fundraising. Um, and it is a growing market, and my, myself and other colleagues from um, heading up university fundraising uh, met a couple of weeks ago, and, and recruitment and retention of staff was a real issue. And moving from Aberdeen, I thought it would be easy finding staff in London, and, and, and it's not really easy, particularly we've got colleagues in the room from King's who are growing massively and now have a fundraising team of 100. Um, and, uh, you, know, you, could, you know, Great Ormond Street have 100, 150. Um, universities in the States would typically have um, fundraising teams at two, three hundred, and the big private universities. 
Um, so I think development in, and fundraising in, in the university sector is at a stage of a curve where there's going to be a lot of potential. And it's not just because of the cutbacks, it's just because it's a huge amount of, um, we're just becoming a bit more sophisticated in how we do that. But there are specific re recruitment yeah. consultants that deal with yeah. charities, like Harris Hill, for example, are, yeah. are one. Um, or there's specific websites, like you could go on thir um, thirdsector.co.uk, they produce a magazine um, all about what's happening in the third sector, and they've got a jobs element on there, or jobsincharities.co.uk, they do both volunteer and um, paid for jobs. So there's kind of, there's other areas. I mean, if you went to a recruitment consultant and explained what, what made yeah. you tick, they might then be able to look at what they've got in the charity world and take it forward, yeah. Just got one up there, question there. Do you want, she's just coming with the microphone. So. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, as Alan, Alison was saying, um, if you, it seems to me that if you want to, you know, you're not sure how you want to get into the third sector, volunteering is the best way to do it. And I just really wanted to plug a couple of, I don't work for either of them, they're both actually charities, um, but Reach Skills, is one thing, if anyone wants to write it down. Another one called Bright One Communications, and basically they match people who have skills in communications or anything you do in your, your maybe corporate job, and they match you up with a charity where you can do volunteering in your spare time. It doesn't really impinge on your life. So I think that's a good way yeah. to do right. it. Right. If, you're, if you're coming from the comms or journalism background, um, then Media Trust does something similar. Yeah. Mm. Um, and if you're a small organisation out there looking for uh, help with comms or media, then I would recommend their matching service yeah. too. Somebody over here. Was there, yeah, there you, go. you go first. Uh, hi, my name's Nick. I was wondering um, how wise is it to be spontaneous in looking for work? Because you know you can look, you can look at applications and fill them out and, and send them in. But uh, how wise is it to just kind of send around your CVs to to places you've researched and like from from your point of view, do you just kind of throw them in the bin, or do you actually <laughs> have a look at them? Um, I'd say. If, if someone contacts us, um, we'll definitely, if there's nothing available, we'll, we'll definitely, if they're passionate, you know, and the, the skills are, are right on the CV and everything, we'll definitely remember them and, and, and try and keep in touch if possible, because it is, like you're saying, it's, it's um, to get the right people is so important, especially, especially these days. So, um, yeah, definitely wouldn't just throw it in the bin. We'd, we'd definitely, uh, um, if something stood out, we'd definitely remember it, no problem. I had an email yesterday from a graduate um, of UCL who's working in Doha and he's working as a journalist and um, he knows we've got campus there now and so I suppose he's taking the initiative to connect back to us and say that he's around and you know he's interested and so I've passed that on and James sent him an email today and the head of communications has now got his details and we've got a visit coming up in November so you know I think, I think it is worth it if it's a targeted where there maybe is some connection. And so you never know, yeah, do you? You just right? never know. Plus, the, there's always volunteering opportunities that then the person might just say, yeah, come in and volunteer for X, and you never know. So. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a tough old market out there. I mean, that's what's come out of the economic downturn. I mean, we've just done a recruitment round for an entry-level um, position, an administrative assistant stroke fundraising assistant. We had 160 applicants, not through any... Um, Headhunters, I mean, not through Harris Hill this time, I mean, just we, we managed it in-house. And the calibre of the candidates was incredible. So I really do think um, augmenting your CV with direct experience by volunteering, but also showing, if ever you are applying, your passion for the cause. Because what shocked me is what a small percentage of the applicants had actually taken the time to explain why they wanted to work for best beginnings. Mm. Um, so if you are doing on spec, it's about explaining why you are connected to the course, Tell why you you're interested in the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, it's tough. Mm. If there isn't a job to give you, then what you're really applying for is basically, notice me, please, and, you know, maybe get an, ask for an internship or some kind of unpaid work experience, get your foot in the door, get your face known. And then it's really, a, my experience with this is it's about, it's, a, lot of it's, a lot of it's about luck in timing, and that's not something you can really um, do very much about. But a lot of it's also about doing your homework. 
and, and making sure that you're sending your CV and your letter to exactly the right person. It doesn't go to the receptionist and straight in the bin. It doesn't necessarily go to the head of HR. It goes to the head of the department that you want to work for and you spelt their name correctly and you know exactly, you know, that you're going to, f you say, you make the letter approachable, a little bit chatty, memorable, um, you sound like a nice person, you're not, you don't oversell yourself um, and you follow it up with a phone call or an email if you don't get a response, you probably won't and you just strike that difficult balance between persistent and a pain in the arse. <laughs> <laughs> because basically people do want to know, I look, certainly look for people in my department who are just the right side of pushy. You know, who, who know what they want and who know they want to work for me and who really, really, you know, will ring me for the second time when I've said, yeah, yeah, you know, and I've forgotten and then they call me back and then, okay, all right, I'll, you know, we'll go out and we'll have coffee and but we don't have anything at the moment but we are looking for an intern in the next couple of months and, and that's how you get the first opportunity and it's tough. And I mean, we can have a whole another discussion and I guess we probably will at some point about unpaid internships um, because they are increasingly the way in. At, at least if you're not coming with a very solid background in professional skills, either from another NGO or from a corporate uh, role that really is very transferable. Marketing. Well, I think we've got time for two more questions before we move in. So there's one here and then um, you had your hand up first. So I'll get my hands up. Yeah, on you go. That really ties in very well with the question I had. Uh, my name's Christian. Um, I'm um, a human rights graduate here at UCL. Uh, I totally agree with um, you know uh, volunteering and, and trying to get a feel of how it is to work in a charity before you actually go and do it. Um, however, um, having you know in, in trying to do a career change, you will find that if you're already in a paid position and you're trying to get into a charity, what you've just said is, is very important. Uh, Char uh, volunteering is increasingly the way in and I personally would find it quite hard to intern full-time uh, to get that experience um, and then you know maybe go for an entry-level job in a charity um, if I have to support myself um, I know um, it's it's probably easier for someone maybe who is from from London but you know it's just a, um, a, a something on the side but um yeah i find that you know it's um it's not necessarily uh easy to to do both um so even with volunteering um say i've given it a day a week there here a day a week there doing the degree doing my uh, my my full-time job as well it's still quite hard to mm, make that count somehow and relating to your question I found that if, I don't know, in my personal experience, I found that if I just kind of send CVs around, um, you know, there won't be much result. And I, you know, um, I've been advised that actually you have to really target your application to something that you think will be a good match for what you think. But that's, that's just my experience. Yeah, and here. sell, I mean, sell yourself. Like, why should we be interested in you? You know, like, what have you got to offer? And even if you're only offering a day a week, that you can give a day a week for the next three months and you really like to work on this and you, you know, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's really mm. tough. You have my absolute sympathy. Yeah. And we, I mean, we have quite a lot of weekend volunteering you can do and stuff like that as well. And although, you know, that takes up even more of your time, that, that still might be an option to see if yeah. somewhere does, uh, you are able to get in on weekends and stuff. So, yeah. I've got a volunteer who's helping me one day a week on a special high-profile project, which is an exhibition the V&A is working on with the Kremlin. And she's very experienced. She's got museum experience in the States. And I give her really meaningful tasks, and she does them extremely well. So, you know, she's building up her portfolio of experience and helping me hugely. Yeah, just, just Hi. I, oh. <laughs> I just wanted to carry on about um, first getting off into the charity sector and first opportunities. Um, just to say, I'm Catherine. I studied history at UCL. I'm currently working for a national charity. Um, one opportunity I found really useful, and particularly for people who have been working but not necessarily in the 
voluntary sector as trustee opportunities, getting involved in the governance of charities, and you can really bring skills such as being a lawyer or marketing or communications to that role. So that was quite helpful. And also just to say, I found the experience of having a mentor in the charity sector really helpful. I have a mentor who's a director of policy and strategy at a major charity, and he's really helpful in helping me with my career development. So don't be afraid to contact people and say, Oi, I'll buy you a cup of tea, help me. Because they will, I would. Um, and also to say, Guardian on Wednesdays, it's amazing. Look for jobs. OK, yeah. thank you. That, that was really helpful. I think that those points about getting involved in, as a trustee and, and a mentor um, certainly something that, that I've done and, and, and actually actively looking to do because having moved away from Scotland and the charities that I was involved with there um, and also one that was in the Gambia, I've had to kind of give up. Um, I am thinking, you know, what do I do next and how do I get involved? And, um, but, and it is a, it's a difficult, you have to think very carefully in that decision as well and how you spend your time. But in we'll in move, in sorry. To, sorry, to yeah, in, in my job and in our department yeah. fundraising, mentoring is becoming one of the major ways for our career yeah. development plans. And um, now the Institute of Fundraising is, is working on a mentoring scheme for fundraisers and everything. So there are ways yeah. in, but, but you're right, yeah, definitely. Um, I've got a mentor myself that's a director of fundraising because that's where I want to be one day. So, um, yeah, that's definitely important. mentoring. Well, there's going to be plenty of time at the end to kind of pick up some of the themes here, but um, I think it would be, if I just introduce um, Tessa now. Um, Tessa graduated um, in History of Art. Uh, she's the Deputy Keeper of Sculpture, Metalwork, Ceramics and Glass at the v &A. What a wonderful job. That just sounds Very wide ranging. Fabulous <laughs> job. Um, and she has 28 years experience as a museum creator, working at the Museum of London and then since 1990 at the v &A. Um, As Deputy Keeper, she manages a department of 31 staff. She was the lead creator of the widely acclaimed Whitley, is it Whitley or Whiteley? Whiteley. Whiteley Sacred Silver and Stained Glass Galleries, which opened in 2005, and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Galleries, which opened in June 2009. Um, she's also published widely and um, run various symposiums, and I'm just delighted that you're here. And well, it's lovely to, to be you. back at UCL. <laughs> Shall you. I carry on? Carry yeah. on. Well, I did actually do a joint honours here, uh, English literature and history of art, and it was incredibly valuable to learn the communication skills through the wide range of reading that obviously reading English literature involves. But I think one of the key experiences for me doing history of art here at UCL was the opportunity to learn in front of objects in museum collections. And I think that's what really sparked my um, commitment to museum work. I did also work as a volunteer while I was an undergraduate um, at the British Museum, Department of Prints and Drawing which of course is just down the road, it's incredibly convenient. And then I decided to go on and do postgraduate MPhil, which was um, upgraded to a PhD. And I was extremely lucky in that I chose a subject which was um, just hitting a tercentenary. Uh, my thesis was on Huguenot uh, artists, designers and craftsmen in Great Britain and Ireland, again very wide ranging. Um, and I picked up that the Museum of London was looking to do an exhibition to mark the tercentenary of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which forced these Protestants to leave France and take up residence in other Protestant countries that could offer them employment opportunities. So my thesis got turned into an exhibition. I mean, you know, that was luck. Um, but I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, I also, because of my passion and fascination um, with, you know, the whole threshold, I had joined one or two learned societies. I think it's a society for church monuments. We used to go on crawls around particular parts of the country looking at monuments. Um, and I got to know another museum professional through that, who's now actually Keeper of Western Art at the Ashmolean. Um, and he said to me, oh, there's a job coming up at the Museum London, you know, you should go for it. And it's, again, it's that sort of mentoring relationship, somebody who spots your ability and says, you know, go for it. And it gives you added confidence, doesn't it, if somebody who's already established encourages to, you to do that. Um, but during the process of, of research, I had done various part-time jobs. I worked as a driver guide with the London Tourist Board. And, you know, that was fascinating, meeting people from all sorts of different walks of life, um, using French as well. Um, I taught in an art school. I lectured on art history to some um, art undergraduates. So that was, that was really um, demanding, because they're so visually attuned. And I remember putting two slides of, I think it was a Monet sunrise, and actually it was the same painting, and somebody at the back said, hmm, 
you know, that's the same painting, you're trying to make a comparison. I said, no, 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 I'm just testing you, you know, but it was that sort of <laughs> keeping you on your toes. Um, anyway, so I joined the Museum of London in 1981, did this big exhibition on the Huguenots in 1985. Um, and in the course of that, discovered a um, particularly stunning private collection in Northamptonshire, um, a great house called Boughton House, which not only has wonderful collections, but also incredible archives. Um, so I wrote to the owner saying, this is an amazing combination. This house deserves a book. And so he said, yeah, fine, um, find a publisher, um, and you do it. So I did, and I did. But I didn't do it all myself. I brought a team of about 18 different expert contributors together. Um, and I got a British Academy grant to allow me to have six months off to research the archives um, for my job at the Museum of London to be, to be backfilled. And I think it was sort of going, you know, outside the box, doing another project, which actually was my ticket to get a job at the V&A. And I worked in the furniture department at the V&A for 11 years, and then at the Museum of London because I'd worked in silver and jewellery when a job came up in metalwork at the V&A, I was able to move from furniture to metalwork. And it's quite unusual to change areas of expertise in, in that way. But uh, I, I would sort of recommend having a kind of broad range of interest and then being able to draw on other expertise, other areas, to kind of enrich your particular focus at the time. Um, as far as the highlights are concerned, I think being able to share one's research with a wider audience um, and teaching, which is something I, I regularly do. Um, I teach for the Smithsonian program in, in the US at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, the, the low points, well, again, you know, the recession has hit the museum sector very seriously. We had to make 15% cuts over the last financial year. And we had to lose three members of staff out of a department of, of 31. And it was extremely hard making those decisions. Um, in the end, a couple of people who um, were effect made voluntarily redundant were all over, already over the retirement age. And I'm happy to say one of those colleagues uh, then got a sort of honorary research position in the research department. So that was a kind of graceful conclusion. I'm delighted to say that a bit of initiative with the development team, and development teams in museums are extremely important and need new vitality. Um, we managed to get sponsorship for one of my colleagues who otherwise would have been redundant. And in, in the States, it's very common to have endowed curatorial posts, but here it's still quite rare. And we found an octogenarian who's um, Business was uh, one of the leading London goldsmiths business of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, Barnards came Wakeley and Wheeler, um, and then Paget and Mr. Paget decided to endow this post so that the archive of his business, which is in the V&A, could be properly researched, be used as a basis for exhibitions, uh, for study days. And he's absolutely thrilled to have a curator with whom he can share his life's passion and also introduce her to other people who work for that organisation. So it's also become an oral history project. And I think it's a wonderful example of actually giving Mr. Paget in his 80s a new lease of life because he can see his life's work being mm. revitalised. So from a low point, I think that's been turned into something very exciting. But obviously, I could go on talking yeah. for, for a while, but I think yeah. passion is probably one of the keys, tenacity, um, but also willingness to do things in your own time, exhibitions, books, research projects, you know, they just don't happen nine to five. It is a vocation. But for me, I think the key is thinking about succession planning, planting that seed of enthusiasm and excitement in the next upcoming generation of curators. And so we try and make it possible even for post-GCSE students to come in and do a two-work placement so they can begin to understand what the excitement is of working um, for a great national collection and making that whole subject area uh, widely known. Tessa, that's wonderful, thank you. Finally, I'd like to introduce Polly Marquianda, who's uh, Head of Communications at Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, Polly has been um, working at MSF for 14 years. She's currently Director of Communications for the UK and Ireland. And I'll let you do the rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Um, so I uh, was here doing history uh, when I was uh, undergraduate, I think 91 to 94. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I mean, kind of history was interested in history because 
I was interested in people and sort of how things happened and big world events and but I was a bit lost and, and I, I really I, I didn't I didn't know what I wanted to do it wasn't I didn't have a strong vocation I always wish I had I had however as a 16 year old um, been uh, working in a hairdresser on a Saturday sweeping up hair from the floor and um, one, one of the magazines there God, I've been thinking back, it must be 1988. Um, this magazine doesn't exist anymore. And I had this really cool article about um, a guy who'd gone to visit a, a project run by Médecins Sans Frontières in Afghanistan. And the guy, the journalist had actually been shocked whilst he was out there. So it was a kind of exciting article. And I remember reading that in the hairdresser in between sweeping up the hair and thinking, God, I know, that sounds really cool. <laughs> I wish I could do something like that. And it stuck with me, kind of stuck in my brain. And um, I just had this kind of idea that, God, I really want to work for them. But I, I hadn't any idea how. And then when I was um, doing my history degree, you know, the, took advantage of the long summer holidays and used to go traveling quite a bit. And I remember going to Thailand with my best friend, I think it must have been the second year, and we had been there about five days and we plowed through a good half of our holiday money. <laughs> so beer, Thai beer was really expensive. And we ended up taking a flight to Cambodia on the basis that it was going to be cheaper in Cambodia. And um, it, it, it was kind of arrived in this country and it was a weird period. And the UN had, manned, uh, had just been there um, overseeing the first elections, first free elections. And there weren't really any tourists there. And the place was completely, um, you know, apart from Cambodians, full of uh, UN agencies, different UN agencies, different NGOs, and we spent some time kind of hanging out with some UN people from different contingents and some people from NGOs, and I started to think, wow, actually, this would be really cool. I don't quite how I would do this and not quite what, sure what they're doing, but I'd like to be involved in something international like this, something where things are happening, well, you know, things are changing for people. It was still a bit nebulous, but I had this idea that that's what I wanted to do. So then I came back, finished my degree, just about, skin on my teeth, and um, thought, right, okay, world, you need, you need changing, here I am, <laughs> I'm ready to change you, and, you know, no, nothing else at all. <laughs> Ended up with a secretarial job at a design company, because, um, yeah, my boyfriend, also from UCL, now my husband, um, was uh, doing his law conversion course, uh, becoming a barrister and um, one of us needed to pay the rent. So uh, we, um, I ended up uh, working as a secretary in a design company which was kind of interesting, kind of not, um, for nine months. And then I was very fortunate and a lot of, there's a lot of nepotism if I'm honest involved in, in, in lots of careers. Um, my father was working at a time in Moscow and he had a, a friend out there, an American friend who had a small NGO and he basically arranged with her that I could go and work for her for free, for three months. But because he was living there, I could stay at his apartment. So I did this internship um, uh, in this Russian NGO, American NGO working in Russia. It's called the Farmer to Farmer Programme. They sent farmers from Idaho to farmers <laughs> in Siberia and had this kind of cultural experience. It was very fun um, reading <laughs> <laughs> the different experiences they'd had. Anyway, came back. Now I have an NGO experience on my CV. Come on, guys. Some of us want me. I sent out, it must have been 200 applications to different NGOs, a resounding silence, nobody wants me. Again, you know, mortgage needed, pay not mortgage, rent needed paying. Um, so ended up at an um, uh, employment agency on Baker Street. Um, and they sent me for a week to Marks and Spencers. And actually the first week I was in the, um, in the, the section which does graduate entry, and, and Marks and Spencer, which is actually a really great company to work for, I totally recommend it. Um, they had this graduate entry program, and it was absolutely terrifying because I was, you know, adding in all the details of people who were applying. And basically, if you hadn't got, you know, first degree and been head boy or head girl and captain of the football team, I mean, you completely weren't in with a chance. And I was sitting there with my two one, thinking, oh crap, you know, uh, what happens now? Anyway, as she went well because then I got transferred to somewhere else. And I kind of liked it at Marks and Spencers, and after nine months there as a temp, um, they offered me a buying job, um, actually on the programme that I thought I would never have gotten into in the first place. But I really didn't want to go into retail, and I still have my heart set on MSF. So I did what I just advised you to do, which is I basically realised that MSF had now just opened an office in, in, in London, 
And I did a bit of research and found out who the right person was, who the head of office was, and got her name spelt correctly, because it only had the one L. And I wrote her this letter, which I could still almost verbatim and tell you, basically saying, I, you know, I just really want to work for you, and I will work for you for free for as long as my bank account can stand it. Please, please, please give me a job. Mm -hmm. And bless her, she, um, she rang me up and said, actually, we, um, we send Christmas presents out to the expats who are in the field. Would you like to come in for a week? and help wrap Christmas presents. And so I took a week's unpaid leave from Marks and Spencer and went and wrapped Christmas presents for a week. And it was such a small office, there were only four people. And the first time I went in, the woman who opened the door, she wasn't wearing any shoes. And I just thought, oh, still, I want to work for you more than ever. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so cool. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I went back to um, Marks and Spencer's and I was still considering, you know, really moving into the career thing there. And I said to them, OK, can you give me a week to think about it? And on the fourth day of that week, the Thursday, and I had to give them an answer by the Friday, M uh, MSF, God, I used to get that mixed up so much, M &S, MSF, MSF <laughs> rang me back and said, we've got the funding for a half-time job. Are you interested? And I mean, just, I just couldn't be more interested. And my, my parents-in-law still think I'm nuts <laughs> not taking the master's best's job. But... Um, uh, yeah, so I took this half-time job at MSF, and it didn't pay, I mean, it paid like nine grand a year or something. I mean, it was just, I think that was nine grand a year pro rata or something. I mean, it was pittance. And so I would work in the morning for M MSF. In the afternoon, I was working with um, a, for a commercial PR company, which was utterly soul-destroying, and the only good thing about it was that it made me realise how lucky I was not to be there full-time. And in the evening, I had an evening job. And there was a period of five or six months where I had three jobs. My husband was still a student and I was supporting us all and it was exhausting. And I look back now and I wonder how I did it. But I did. And then the M MSF job went full time and I was able to give up flogging refrigerators to soft drinks to people who frankly have better things to write about. And, um, and that started me off. And MSF was very small when I started. I think I was the fifth person in the office and we're now 50 something. And at, through that it's years, as the organisation has grown, I mean, I've kind of grown with it. And I've, you know, I've done so many jobs that kind of grew in stature and importance. And I was in incredibly lucky with my first boss, who now, by the way, runs a company called Just Giving, oh, which yes. I guess you're doing a lot with, which is a fantastic yeah. company. If you mm. ever do any kind of, um, mm. you know, a marathon or fundraising event, mm. Just Giving are great. Um, but she was just a fantastic, fantastic boss. She was, um, she was my mentor. She still is, if I'm honest. I mean, we don't have a formal mentor relationship, but absolutely fantastic. And, and, and saw my potential and my desire to do things and gave me more and more responsibility and took, let me take credit for things that I got right. And when I fouled something up, she would take the responsibility for it. So she was just an amazing boss to have. And I've been very lucky. Um, there was a time in the middle of my career there, I'd reached a, a kind of a glass ceiling and um, and in fact I was looking for another job I just thought oh, you know it's time to move on and then I got pregnant which wasn't ideal I explained why the interview shirt was a bit tight um, and uh, sort of stuck it out because you can't get a new job if you're pregnant um, and then kind of came back after maternity leave and just did little bits and pieces here and there and potted about with publications and the website and then had another baby and then actually took a year sabbatical and went and did a master's degree in marketing and communication and it was just the best thing to do is it took all of the experience that I had learned on the job and kept it and made me realize that actually those years of working in the same organization which I made me wonder if I'd maybe been stuck in a bit of a rut they weren't at all and I had, had this huge range of experiences and opportunities that did make sense in the real world and so and then I'm spent three months in South Africa doing my dissertation and when I came back I basically moved within six months into the head of department role and where I've been ever since and I now do a lot of recruiting and uh, it's brutal guys I mean I feel for you <laughs> I really do I'm recruiting for a press officer at the moment I mean I have a very happy wonderful team of incredibly skilled people um, and, you know, the applications we got, and we set the standard high. I mean, I said, you need fluent French, you need five years' experience, and the kind of, I mean, we got 60 applications. I'd done five first-round interviews. Any one of them could do the job. 
I mean, I, you know, down to the last two now, and it's um, it's really tough. And what if I would say to you, if you're applying, I mean, what I said to you before, a target, target, target. You should decide exactly who you want to work for, get their name right, get it on their desk, explain why you want to work for them. So don't give them the impression that this is one of 200 letters you're sending out, even if it is. And for God's sake, if it's a communications job, please, please, don't just spell check. Reread it. Don't make a single spelling mistake. Don't get your grammar wrong. I've been things, because I can afford to, if I've got 60 applicants and I'm desperate to try and make some kind of decision between them, if you've made a spelling mistake, if you've got something wrong in your CV, I will bin you. And, um, you know, I'm sure we've lost some good candidates like that, but I have to find a way to make a distinction. Also, I would advise not putting things like, I have great communication skills. <laughs> okay, if you have great communication skills, you don't need to say it. It, I, it will be clear in your letter, which will be really compelling and spot on and will make me like you, even though I haven't met you. And, and yeah, just don't waffle. Come straight to the point. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've got 15 minutes, so I'm just going to keep the conversations going with the questions. So any other questions? I know there was some over right, right at the back here. I love that phrase you use on the right side of pushy. I think that, that it really does capture the kind of mm. approach. Uh, hello, my name's Henry. Um, I'm currently studying in Museum Cultures uh, course at Birkbeck and working part-time at the RAF Museum, just working in the shop. Um, my question is really to Tessa. Um, I did, a, as part of my course, I did a three-month uh, work placement working with the curators of the Foundling Voices uh, project yeah. at uh, the Foundling Museum, which was fantastic. Mm. And um, as really, I, I really want to get into curating. Um, my question is, when I was looking at this about sort of five, three or four years ago, um, all of the curating roles seem to require you having a PhD. How, how necessary would you say a PhD is in pursuing a career in curating? I don't think a PhD is essential. I think it's almost essential to have a master's now, and the com competition is such. Um, we advertise for five or six uh, assistant curators roughly every 12 months. And if I tell you, we had 700 applicants this time. Uh, and of course, we're getting applicants from, you know, right across the world, but, you know, depending on where the econ economic situation is really bad, um, that's where they're coming from. So we had a lot of applicants from Greece and a lot from Italy this time. And of course, the, the Europeans come with fantastic language skills as well. Mm. So, I mean, again, I think what we're looking for is, is somebody who's really thought through the application. We, we know we advertise sort of the four different curatorial departments, and I think if you can demonstrate that your skills match one of those, or even two of those curatorial departments, so you're willing to be flexible, um, and, and demonstrate your, your engagement, um, you know, not, not just your, your skill base, but how you're going to apply those skills. Um, obviously, your experience at the Foundling Museum will be invaluable. Um, and with, I haven't yet seen that exhibition, but it sounds wonderful. But, but an engagement with oral history is something, obviously, we're looking at now um, often. And, you know, the, the, the whole experience of, of writing for websites and, you know, apps and, I mean, the whole kind of IT aspect of museums. It's not just who actually walks through the door. It's, you know, what have we had in the last year? 24 um, million hits on our website, I think, whether is it the second or the third most popular museum website in the world. Um, you know, that is how we bring in the punters. And of course, with the, you know, the tourist market opening out, you know, we have uh, website features in, in, in Chinese and in Japanese. And, you know, we need to develop that. And, encompass the Indian languages and Arabic and so on. So, you know, it's a global phenomenon. So there's, there's lots of scope, but it's kind of, it's your engagement with what you can actually deliver using your skills and experience. I would, I would concentrate on, you know, if you've got the masters, that's great. And then, you know, get in there. Thank you. Thanks, Tessa, that's great. Any other questions? Got one down at the front here.
Um, hi, I'm Alison. I graduated in 2002. Um, I had a few comments just about your question about jobs. Um, <coughs> I was also going to add to some of the suggestions as Relief Web, um, DevNet Jobs, Bond is another one, and Red R also is a sort of consult well, um, recruitment consultancy almost. Um, the other thing, second point before my question was just people have mentioned doing volunteer work and internships. Um, it's a time and a place thing, but I, I haven't really heard much about uh, overseas internships. And I just wanted to say that I did one, I was like early 20s, it's a bit easier to do. Um, it was unpaid, but I just wanted to point out that actually I probably saved money doing it because I, I had part of the deal was that you have your uh, flights and accommodation paid for and you get a stipend and it's not very much. But if you're paying a London rent and earning not very much, you're actually better off. And once you've done that for six months or a year, then you can. So I just wanted to put that out there if anyone's in a position to do that. Um, my actual question <laughs> was, um, you've all mentioned working outside of a not-for-profit not sector in various roles, um, whether you enjoyed them or not. And um, I myself have never never done that. Um, I've been working for eight or nine years in the not-for-profit sector. And I I'm intrigued. I would like to just go over for a year and see what I could learn because I get very frustrated, certainly with um, lack of accountability um, or less accountability, perhaps um, if, um, efficiency, particularly with funds. And I wonder if you could, if you've learned anything outside of not not for profit sector, if you think there's anything you could bring back in those skills that you learned that you found useful, um, particularly in the not for profit sector. A huge amount and also if you're working somewhere at the moment where you feel that there isn't that accountability or efficiency you can also look within the third sector as well um, it gives you a different perspective um, I don't know what your role is at the moment and to, so therefore it's difficult in fact you want to say a little bit more I'm actually doing a, my masters at the moment yeah. at London School of Hygiene um, I did a nursing qualification I was working in health programs and my I ended up um, managing health programs overseas sort of field based programs um, so certainly financial in terms of reporting and how you use your funds and there was a lot of inefficiency and are we really achieve you know are we achieving what we set out to do with the money we have and there wasn't a lot of evidence that we were but it seemed to be okay and you get more money anyway so that kind of that kind of thing so I wouldn't I couldn't say specifically what you should or could go to do but that sense of life is a journey and you don't know what skills you're going to acquire but you just need to be open to what you're learning as you are and be thinking about how they are transferable when when the opportunity arises and I think the key method idea is about seizing opportunity so it might be seizing an opportunity to work somewhere that just intrigues you and it won't stop what you're doing now as long as in an interview in the future you can justify your rationale at the time and talk to what you learned from that additional experience that's a great thing I think it's incredible how many people you know in, in days gone by people had one or two careers and now it seems that it just doesn't necessarily work like that anymore so the idea of wanting to explore other ways of working is great. If you feel the need, then go for it. <laughs> for me, it was um, a, a year that kind of, I, would, I think if I hadn't done that year, I'd still be wondering, am I doing the right thing, you know? Because I, I wanted to do geology and I didn't. Um, I'd still be wondering, am I doing the right thing? Is there more out there? Is the grass greener on the other side? But going and experiencing it, and okay, I didn't have the greatest time in the world, but you're right, I did learn other skills to be a bit more a business minded especially like you say with finance and everything because there are um, sometimes in the charity sector it is a bit softer and that sort of thing so um, you do need to you, I've found that you you do need to be very business minded especially these days and as a fundraiser okay. Probably time for one more question Hi, hello um, my name is Paulina I graduated uh, European history in uh, UCL in 2008 I've done my MA uh, currently, I'm fully employed in um, a small private company. I'm an account manager, uh, and I'm desperate to change. <laughs> so maybe I can swap with the <laughs> lady in the front because <laughs> I can quite get. I get a lot of good skills, but I've done it for many, many years. So I kind of know where where I want to go with uh, my non-profit kind of career now. And my question is for Polly. Um, I managed to kind of put my foot in um, volunteering now, which was really, really hard. I didn't know that I kind of imagined myself, I'm 
trying to be a slave for somebody and they don't even want that. So I thought, <laughs> but it's horrible. <laughs> it must be so, so difficult there. Um, but this is not really related exactly to what I'm gonna, what I'm interested in as an organization wise. So it's a little bit different. So when you flick through CVs, when you pick people, I know you have very high standards, but if somebody doesn't have any uh, volunteering, is it better to have any volunteering experience rather than, you know, just... It really depends you know what, I mean? what you're applying for. So, um, so the press officer job that I'm talking about, um, so one of the applicants, and neither of the applicants have volunteered for us, but they both have substantial work experience that makes it relevant. So one of them's been a, a journalist with an international broadcaster for 15 years, and the other one's been a press officer for a major charity for eight years. And so at that level, you don't then need to prove it. It's the kind of entry-level jobs that you do. Um, and yeah, like I said, either you come with professional skills you know, that exactly meet what I'm looking for and there are things that I can tell you as well about applying for jobs where it's a proper job there's a job description there's an advert I mean just as an aside as a tip for you guys because I'm now at the other end look at the language that they use and repeat it back to them in your application letter so if they say we're looking for people who have these skills and this experience and that and the other a kind of Almost go through it and point out in your letter that you have mentioned that you have all of these things. Use the language that they're asking for and repeat it back to them. Try and keep it to one side if you can as well. Um, in terms of, I mean, what is it you want to do? Let me be a bit more specific. Um, well, I'm really, really interested in kind of um, marine um, environmental uh, charities and trusts and things like that. Okay. But I got a uh, volunteering opportunity with London Zoo, which is not exactly, you know, I'm going to be kind of showing animal, people around. You know, it's yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not as charity. close I as I wish it. it would be. But I was just wondering if you, you know, if you have similar CVs and then one of them has volunteering that is not exactly you know, yeah, related I mean, to what you're looking I would for. Say that sort of thing is, re I mean, I don't recruit for a marine charity, but I would yeah. say that kind of thing is relevant enough. Yeah. Is it? You okay. know, you've proven that you have not just an, an interest in a kind of academic, I like watching these things on the documentaries, but actually I will get up and go unpaid to feed penguins or whatever <laughs> it is you were doing at the... <laughs> I think it, that pro it, it proves that you, you know, you really have that desire to do <laughs> you know, that line of work. And I wouldn't, I mean, I, I'm, I don't recruit in that line of work, but I would imagine it's relevant enough. And then you, then it's a question about selling yourself in your letter. It's not all about your CV. Your CV can only tell you, you know, what, and, and, and another tip, guys, sorry, it kind of sounds like a TV workshop, is please don't put your education at the top of your CV. Because I'm not really interested in your education. I'm interested in what you can do. And so, you know, even if you've most recently been educated and you've been working before that, Put the work experience at the top and the education stuff underneath. Mm -hmm. That would be my tip. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's going to be plenty of time to, to move through. Um, I suppose the, the sort of message is that um, it is a bit of a journey, and um, I was reflecting on the journey that, that you've all had. Um, we've had the mission for deep sea fishermen to the bison <laughs> poo. Absolutely. The volunteering at the British Museum mm -hmm. while you were a student. Mm -hmm. And the Idaho farmers in Moscow, which sounds really strange. Um, my, my strangest one was um, doing sort of safer sex promotion nights in fishing villages in the North Sea of Scotland, northeast <laughs> coast of Scotland. Um, and of course, here we are doing all these other grown up jobs now. <laughs> um, and at Scope and, and um, the VE, which is just fascinating, and, and MSF, and, and, and setting up your own charity, which is just simply wonderful. So um, I think hopefully you've had um, some inspiration tonight. Um, I've certainly enjoyed hearing everybody's experiences. Um, I, these things don't happen um, um, easily in one sense. There's lots of people at the back of the room sitting quietly who helped organise. So thank you to my colleagues in AV and um, in events and in alumni relations for putting this all together. And if you could just thank them and our panellists for, for this evening. Thank you very much.